Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named Helix Season 2. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama takes place on a regular cruise ship where all passengers died overnight, leaving a chaotic scene filled with 27 bodies. The deaths were horrific, with victims either covered in fungal spots or killed in mutual slaughter. Despite a thorough examination at the scene, disease control experts found no clues. The disease control center doctor, Sarah, attempted to open a wardrobe in a cabin, only to discover a lone survivor inside. The survivor was agitated, but a quick shot of a sedative from Sarah's colleague put her into a brief coma. When the survivor woke up, her mental state was much improved, and she began to share her terrifying experiences from the past couple of days. Two days prior, the cruise ship had passed an unknown island. Ignoring the tour guide's advice, all passengers insisted on spending a day on the island. The following day, upon their return, they began to slaughter each other in a fit of madness. Only the woman who hid in the wardrobe survived. The leading expert from the CDC was named Peter, the infected brother of last season's virus expert, Dr. Allen. After preliminary testing, he determined that the tourists were infected with a virus that destroys the immune system. He planned to visit the island mentioned by the survivor, hoping to locate the source of the infection. However, the security commander hesitated, as exploring the island wasn't within her duty scope. After weighing the options, she decided to transport Peter's expert team to the island, scheduling another vessel to pick them up in two weeks. The survivor was also brought to the island, as Peter needed her to guide them. The island was filled with lush trees, showing no signs of human development. Despite half a day of exploration led by the survivor, they found no clues. Suddenly, a rabbit hanging upside down from a tree, its eyes missing, caught their attention. Just then, as if the survivor had spotted something horrifying, she ran off into the depths of the forest without a word. Peter's team quickly followed. In the process, Sarah accidentally stepped into a pit, and a broken branch pierced her stinky foot. A team member named Kyle immediately stopped to tend to her wound. He was part of the disease control center, focusing more on armed protection. Before long, Peter returned with the runaway survivor. The trap that injured Sarah was an animal snare, confirming that there were indeed people living on the island. The survivor explained that she thought she saw a figure, which was why she ran off. But as she finished speaking, she displayed a look of sheer terror. Following her gaze, they saw a human skull under a tree in the distance. Even more shocking, countless skulls were scattered among the surrounding bushes. As Peter was still in shock, he suddenly heard a frantic scream. The survivor had disappeared. The group quickly followed the trail, discovering blood spatter along the way, likely left by the survivor. Peter became anxious and hurriedly led everyone forward. They soon found an old, dilapidated cabin not far away. Kyle carefully pushed the door open. There were no signs of human habitation. It had clearly been abandoned for a long time. After a search, he found a pool of blood on the kitchen floor. Everyone looked up, only to find the survivor hung from the roof, her death identical to the rabbit's earlier. Kyle suddenly saw a large fire approaching from outside the window. Curious, Peter peered out to see a group of stern-faced monks. He quickly introduced himself and told them about the survivor's gruesome death. The monks were not surprised, as if they knew the dangers of the island. They suggested that Peter and his group follow them to their refuge first. Intrigued, the group followed the large party. Before long, they arrived at the legendary refuge. It was surprising that such a large manor was built on an uninhabited island, seemingly isolated from the world. The residents inside were wary and frightened of outsiders. The leader of the manor was a middle-aged man named Michael. It turned out all the inhabitants were monks who never ventured into the forest outside the manor, for there were things more terrifying than wild beasts there. Michael then suggested that Peter and his group take a rest first. Everything here seemed normal on the surface. However, in the dim basement of the manor, a young girl was tied to an experimental table. She stared at several religious believers in terror, as if undergoing some horrific experiment. Meanwhile, Sarah was sitting alone in her bedroom. A believer came in with a cup of tea. Unfortunately, she didn't recognize that the visitor was Dr. Allen, her long-lost tutor. It turned out he had been lurking in the manor for a long time. In pursuit of the whereabouts of Julia, who had defected to the Laria headquarters as shown in the season one, he had killed many infected immortals from the headquarters group and even blown up their office. The CDC had long expelled Allen, but he didn't give up. During an intense interrogation, he accidentally obtained information clearly marking the location of the uninhabited island. 
Driven by curiosity, Alan infiltrated the manor early to investigate. The next morning, Sarah woke up from her piggy sleep to find a pool of blood on her pillow. She seemed used to it, cleaned herself up, and looked out the window to see a line of monks entering the church. She recognized Alan among them at a glance and hurried out, eager to catch up. Unfortunately, she couldn't find him but discovered a monk with a face full of fungal spots. She wanted to get a closer look, but he vanished in an instant. When Sarah reached the church hall, she suddenly stopped, for all the believers were gathered there, as if holding some ceremony. Sarah, hidden in the corner, finally spotted Alan. Her heart surged with excitement. However, she knew it was not the time to reveal their connection. Michael was making a speech on the stage, and occasional cheers echoed from the crowd below. Just then, a little boy stumbled in. A gasp went through the crowd. His face was covered in fungal spots. He had clearly been infected. Seeing his mother, he dashed towards her like a wild beast. Alan was the first to react, quickly restraining the boy. The crowd hustled to carry the boy away. The incident caused an uproar. Everyone became aware of the existence of the unknown pathogen. Michael asked Peter, for help to eradicate the disease before a large-scale infection could occur. Peter didn't refuse, but insisted he needed to observe and take samples, and lamented the lack of a proper lab. Michael smiled and assured Peter not to worry, revealing that there was a ready lab in the manor. Despite their surprise, Peter had no time to ponder why a religious organization had such facilities. The urgent matter was to deal with the unknown pathogen. Sarah pulled Peter aside and told him she'd seen Dr. Allen. However, upon hearing news of his brother, Peter reacted coldly, suggesting they better not get involved with Allen, given he was wanted. Later, Sarah was sent to extract blood from the infected boy, while Peter led a team to find the other infected individual whom Sarah had spotted. The group cautiously moved through the cold, dark basement, the most likely hiding place for the infected. Sure enough, they soon found traces of the infected individual, who was behaving erratically. This reminded Peter of his own experience being infected at the Arctic base as shown in the last season, and he froze on the spot. Fortunately, Kyle acted in time, but by the time Peter snapped back to reality, the infected person had escaped. Meanwhile, Sarah was in the lab separating pathogens. She didn't wear any protective equipment throughout the process and was nonchalant about the samples touching her skin, all in the pursuit of quick results. Seeing this, Peter couldn't help scolding her. He knew Sarah was an immortal, immune to any infection and with powerful regenerative abilities, but such behavior was difficult to explain to outsiders. Just then, Kyle came over with a message to check on the little boy. Surprisingly, his infection had significantly lessened, but he had forgotten the previous event. This left everyone in utter astonishment. They had never seen such a unique pathogen and decided to investigate the source of the infection separately. Sarah was tasked with tracing the infected person's daily routine. However, it seemed just as usual, picking fruits in the orchard. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Sarah noticed the apples on the trees were exceptionally red and round, noticeably different from those outside. The orchard manager told her that the fruit trees were the result of Michael's genetic grafting techniques. At that moment, Sarah spotted Alan picking fruit in the distance. Seizing an excuse, she eagerly went over to strike up a conversation. With no one around, Alan urged Sarah to leave immediately or no one would survive. But Sarah had too many questions. Before she could voice them, the orchard manager approached. Alan resorted to gesturing, a sign that Sarah recognized as an urgent warning to leave. She wasted no time relaying Alan's message to Peter. However, he was adamant that the disease control personnel would not flee before eliminating the virus. Unable to suppress her worries, Sarah snuck into Alan's bedroom late at night to inquire why he had come to the island and what secrets it was hiding. Alan seemed to be withholding something and refused to divulge any information, only repeating his plea for Sarah to leave as soon as possible. This pushed Sarah to her limit, forcing her to reveal a secret. It turns out she was carrying Alan's child, but strangely, ever since she had become an immortal after receiving Julia's spinal fluid, she had been having daily nosebleeds. And although she had been pregnant for 15 months, she showed no signs of pregnancy. This revelation made Alan more anxious. He insisted that for her and the baby's safety, Sarah should leave the island immediately. Meanwhile, a tall figure stealthily entered the little boy's room, telling him his mother was waiting outside and it was time to see her. The boy believed him and followed the man outside the manor. The man told him to wait and then returned to the manor, closing the gate behind him. As the boy came to his senses, an infected person suddenly appeared in front of him. The boy was kidnapped, and it seemed that some bloodthirsty monsters were lurking outside the manor. Surprisingly, the mother seemed indifferent towards her son's disappearance, seeing it as a divine test. 
The CDC's virus experts, however, were frantic because 28 people had been infected with an unknown virus in recent days. The little boy was the only patient who had managed to recover. Peter found Michael and suggested sending enough people to search for the boy. But the manor manager, obsessed with botanical grafting techniques, was completely unconcerned about the boy's disappearance. This forced the disease control center's research work into a standstill. Sarah had no choice but to find a breakthrough from the bodies of the deceased infected. However, her teammate Kyle discovered that the virus samples collected from the cruise ship had disappeared. He carefully recalled his previous experiences and was certain that he had left the samples in a hut in the forest. When Kyle was preparing to go find them, Peter stopped him and assigned him a new task. The missing boy's teacher, Sister Amy, seemed to hold a good impression of Kyle. He could use this to investigate any unusual behavior before the boy's infection. The task of finding the lost sample was taken over by Peter and Sarah. On their way to the hut, Sarah tried to persuade Peter to enlist Alan's help, but he was adamant. He believed Alan was a globally wanted murderer, and they should avoid any contact with him. They soon arrived at the hut. The survivor's body that had been hanging from the ceiling had disappeared, surely taken by someone. Sarah found the lost sample under the table. Just as she was putting it into her backpack, they heard a banging on the door, accompanied by a ghastly howl. Peter used an oil barrel to barricade the door, opened a window, and led Sarah out of the hut. They ran back to the manor. As soon as they returned, Peter confronted the manor manager, angrily questioning why he had hidden the existence of the infected outside the manor. Michael seemed helpless about it, saying there were always people in the manor who didn't follow the rules or had conflicting ideologies. Most of them had left the manor, and what they turned into was not something he could control. Sarah suspected Michael was hiding something and thought the virus might have spread from the manor. Michael's fascination with plant grafting and hybridization could itself create new species. When they returned to the lab, they found Kyle lying on the ground, covered in blood. They barely managed to wake him up and learned how he got injured. Just a few hours earlier, Kyle persuaded teacher Amy to allow him to conduct physical examinations on the children in the manor. Seizing this opportunity, he started asking around about the missing boy. One little girl seemed to know something, vaguely stating that the missing boy had to be punished for breaking the rules. However, given teacher Amy's presence, she did not reveal more. Kyle's prying, though, didn't go unnoticed by Amy. She went to a secret lab, picking a fruit from a strange plant. After carefully grinding it into a powder, she poured it into a metal inhaler. This peculiar object didn't seem to phase the children of the manor, who eagerly approached the metal container and took a few intense inhalations. Suddenly, the girl's eyes started to tremble, and the other children also expressed their curiosity to try. It wasn't clear how much time had passed when Kyle once again sought the girl to gather some clues. He noticed her abnormal state and was about to ask about it when he saw a group of children with vacant stares slowly surrounding him. Each of them was holding a rock, and they began to pelt Kyle. Thankfully, they were not strong, and Kyle only suffered minor injuries. However, their uncontrollable and violent behavior was unsettling. Sarah knew that involuntary eye trembling was a neurological response, like that caused by drug influence. However, when they returned to the student dormitory, they found everyone had returned to normal and had no memory of the earlier events. The previously missing boy had shown similar symptoms, attacking his mother, but later having no recollection of the incident. Kyle was sure that someone was trying to scare everyone away from the manor. By observing samples from the infected, Sarah confirmed that this was a virus they had never seen before. A chill ran down everyone's spine. Sarah once again suggested seeking Alan's help, as his experience was extensive. Peter, now somewhat panicked, agreed to talk to his brother. Actually, Alan had been exploring the secrets of the manor as well. One day he saw a few barrels of wine being taken into the warehouse. This raised his suspicion, as alcohol was strictly prohibited in the manor. There must be something else in those wooden barrels. After waiting until work ended, Alan, carrying a box of fruit, quietly approached the warehouse. But the main door was locked. Just as he was about to pry it open, he was caught by the gatekeeper. Alan lied that he was there to store fruit. The guard pointed in another direction and stated that the fruit storage warehouse was elsewhere. However, Alan didn't give up there. He secretly followed the guard to the shower room and sprinkled some liquid on a towel. Indeed, when an expert wants to harm someone, they do it silently. Alan successfully obtained the warehouse key from the guard's belongings. Taking advantage of the quiet night, he entered the mysterious warehouse. He found large amounts of honey and jam stored there. It seemed like nothing special at first. Then he recalled the wine barrels he had seen during 
during the day, and out of curiosity, pried one open. Inside, it was empty except for a strange tooth. Just as Alan was puzzled, he was suddenly struck from behind. The attacker was none other than Peter. It was unexpected that after so much time, Peter was still loyally serving the Laria headquarters. It's revealed that his presence in the manor was not just about controlling the virus. After reporting the situation, the senior management of the headquarters gave him a new task, to investigate Alan's purpose for being there. One year later, the brothers finally met again in the manor. Peter had no choice but to continue his charade, pretending to have just happened upon the unconscious Alan. As Peter was stitching up Alan's wounds, he asked about his purpose in the manor. But Alan told him that it was dangerous here, and they should leave immediately. Peter, however, had a mission, and claimed that the CDC wouldn't leave before containing the infection. But stopping an unknown virus was far from simple. Due to the deliberate concealment by the manor's residents, the CDC's investigation had reached a deadlock. However, a small accident finally led to a new development in the investigation. A fruit farmer, while picking fruit, was accidentally stung by a bee. That night, he felt cold all over his body and couldn't stop sweating. The next morning, his face was covered with fungal spots, and he became extremely agitated. Only a few hours later, the farmer suddenly dropped dead on the grassland. This incident triggered panic among the manor's residents again. As they didn't know how he had gotten infected, no one could guarantee that they wouldn't be the next to die. Michael could only try to soothe them, insisting that they should trust the experts at the CDC, who would definitely stop the spread of the virus. Sarah, through autopsy of the infected body, confirmed that the victim died from an unknown virus infection. However, a pinprick wound on the skin surface quickly caught her attention, indicating that an insect-carrying virus might have infected the deceased. As they were preparing to report to Peter, they ran into Alan, who had just finished dressing his wound. As a seasoned virus expert, he carefully reviewed the previous patient's test reports and immediately noticed abnormalities. Their glycated hemoglobin levels were very high, indicating that they had consumed some sweet food before the infection. Combining this with the wound on the current victim, they speculated that the carrier of the virus might be bees. Sarah found the mother of the missing boy and asked whether he had consumed honey before, but she suddenly showed great hostility. The honey here was not for casual consumption, and no one would break the rules. She even sarcastically stated that since the CDC arrived, diseases have been emerging one after another. On the other hand, Kyle went deeper along the orchard and found that the number of bees became denser. Eventually, he found several beehives on the wall at the end of the orchard. The oozing honey was tempting, but Kyle didn't have the impulse to taste it. Instead, he carefully collected samples. After testing, he indeed found the same fungal toxins inside. Surprisingly, the real source of the infection came from the bee's nest. After hearing this, Peter was excited and decided to report this news to the manor manager and asked Kyle to destroy the toxic hive. When he arrived at the orchard fully armed, he found a bottle of honey scattered on the grass and a figure lay not far away. Kyle ran over to check and found that the person was already showing symptoms of the infection. As he was wondering how the virus could have acted so quickly, the infected person suddenly opened his eyes and several figures sprang out from all directions. These individuals had completely lost their sanity and were bent on destroying all living things in sight. Kyle felt something was wrong and ran desperately towards the depths of the orchard. Fortunately, Kyle was agile and managed to evade the infected individuals with ease. When he reached the corner where the beehive was located, only one infected person was still chasing him. Clad in his protective suit, Kyle fought with the infected person among the swarm of bees. Before long, the infected individual died from the multiple stings inflicted by the bees. When the dust had settled, the manor residents had also arrived at the scene. They first smoked out the bees before breaking open the stone wall, revealing a massive beehive inside. The next step was to thoroughly clean out all the honey. Unexpectedly, the bald man named Landry had secretly kept a bottle of the poisonous honey and gave it to his girlfriend Amy as if presenting a treasure, knowing she could use it. Amy, on the surface, was Michael's right-hand assistant, but in reality, she had long been resentful of him due to a shocking secret involving Michael's manor. Just yesterday, Sarah wanted to investigate the clues related to the missing boy. She quietly went to the student dormitory alone, and after a thorough search, found the missing boy's favorite teddy bear. Sarah immediately located the boy's mother. 
The fact that the toy was found with another child suggested that the boy's disappearance was not accidental. However, the boy's mother remained in denial as their leader Michael had already declared that the boy's disappearance was merely a test. Sarah felt that the boy's mother was beyond help, but little did she know, the more she spoke, the more agitated the mother became. Eventually, she pulled out a dagger and stabbed Sarah in the abdomen. After an unknown period of time, Kyle happened upon an unconscious Sarah, soaked in her own blood. Peter and the others were dumbstruck. They were not equipped to perform emergency surgery for such trauma. Fortunately, there was a seasoned medical professional in the manor. Although Kyle was apprehensive, he had no choice but to let the medical professional try their hand at saving Sarah. The elderly professional was indeed quite skilled. After a night of frantic rescue, Sarah had passed the critical stage. However, the old woman was utterly shocked. In her many years of practicing medicine, she had never seen someone recover almost overnight from such severe injuries. This gave her a sense of familiarity, and she rushed to the secret lab to collect some pollen from the plants. She then returned to the ward and, under the pretense of wiping Sarah's face, brought the pollen close to her nose, quietly knocking her out. The old woman carefully observed Sarah's eyes. As she had suspected, the pupils were indeed silver. The woman became alarmed and rushed to Michael's. To her utter surprise, Michael was also an immortal, usually covering the color of his pupils with paint. The secret was known to very few people, only three of Michael's key subordinates. Michael claimed he was the unique immortal in the world, but now there was Sarah. The old woman immediately confronted him. Unexpectedly, Michael was so ruthless that he twisted the old woman's neck without mercy, wanting to continue to conceal his lie. Michael then attributed the old woman's death to a sudden illness. Sister Anne, one of his three main subordinates, was completely fooled and kept comforting Michael not to be too sad. From their conversation, a shocking piece of news was revealed that this man had been alive for over 500 years. The deceased old woman and all the deceased hanging on an entire wall were actually his daughters. Moreover, the other two of the three main subordinates, Anne and Amy, were also his daughters. What Michael didn't expect was that before the old woman came to see him, she had already told Amy about Sarah being an immortal. Once Amy thought about it, she realized that the old woman's death was no accident. It was certainly Michael who had murdered her. To be precise, the old woman was Amy's grandmother, which enraged Amy even more. However, her mother Anne was much more rational, stating that no one should disrespect Michael. At the same time, she reminded Amy that she was almost 20 years old, and it was time for Amy to have a daughter with Michael as per their 500-year-old family tradition. Amy was utterly disgusted by this and declared that she would never do such a thing. In her view, the more chaotic the germ infection, the better, as it could weaken Michael's influence and she could seize the chance to escape. Under Amy's constant pleas, her boyfriend Landry was finally blinded by love and a malicious plan was thus conceived. At the farewell ceremony for the old woman, Michael was giving an incessant eulogy. Meanwhile, Landry was quietly smearing honey-carrying virus onto the candied fruit. As the ceremony was drawing to a close, Michael asked everyone present to taste the candied fruit grown by the late old woman. Not long after, the church was in chaos, with a large group of infected people attacking the survivors like starved beasts, venting their frenzy. Kyle organized everyone, using all available tools to capture the infected. Soon, the entire dining hall became a temporary isolation area. All patients were forcibly secured to their beds and the CDC was bustling with activity. They had to alleviate the patient's pain and investigate the cause of the infection. They found the candied fruit the infected had eaten and through testing, found several jars tainted with poisonous honey. Clearly, this infection was a premeditated attack, but Sarah looked around and couldn't find Peter. She was quite curious where Peter had gone amidst such chaos. It turns out, just a day before, Peter had received orders from Laria headquarters to investigate Alan's purpose in the manor. However, despite numerous attempts, he didn't gather any intel. Having no other options, he revealed Alan's fugitive status to Michael, conjecturing that Alan might endanger the manor. Unexpectedly, Michael took an unusual step. Although he captured Alan that night and locked him in a secret underground prison, he did not spare the ill-intentioned Peter. Surprisingly, the brothers met there. Michael explained Peter's betrayal, and this time Alan finally lost his calm. The brothers started fighting in the dungeon. After a while, both were exhausted. Even with significant resentment, it wasn't as strong as the bond they had as children. Looking at the exit more than two meters high, the two men thought of a way to escape. They decided to form a human ladder, getting one person out first and then pulling the other one up. Initially, Peter wanted to go first, but Alan insisted he had to go first. Peter reluctantly agreed, offering his shoulders for Alan to climb. 
Alan used all his strength to unlock the dungeon, rolled out, and Peter at the bottom eagerly stretched out his hand for help. But Alan got furious. He knew already that Alan was working for the Laria Group. The previous incident at the Arctic base was also due to his betrayal. After berating this shameless traitor, Alan shut the dungeon door and walked away. When he arrived at the lab and found Sarah wasn't there, he was about to go out and look for her when Kyle stopped him. The first thing Kyle did was barrage him with questions about the destroyed building, which aroused Alan's suspicions. He thought that Kyle might also be working for the Laria Group. The two men got into another fight. Unexpectedly, Kyle was agile, and after a few maneuvers, he had Alan handcuffed. It turns out that a year ago, after Alan had blown up the Lair Group's headquarters and then disappeared from the public eye, the Joint Investigation Bureau had specially dispatched virus expert Kyle to infiltrate the CDC to catch him. After a long period of patience, Kyle finally captured Alan. Sarah was so angry that she was trembling all over, but Kyle had already revealed his identity, and he was adamant that he wouldn't let Alan, a wanted criminal, get away. But before he could be defiant for long, there was a sudden outbreak of a virus infection in the church. Kyle had no choice but to let Alan go, as they were in desperate need of manpower at the time. As the chaotic situation was gradually brought under control, the instigator Amy was not willing to let things rest. A new plan was hatched. She quietly went to the room where the missing boy's mother was detained and began to sow discord. Since the CDC arrived, the manor hadn't had a single day of peace. The boy's mother was right to stab Sarah and shouldn't be locked up here for punishment. Amy then left the cell, deliberately leaving the door unlocked. The boy's mother instantly understood the implication. Using her extensive network of connections in the manor, she quickly gathered a large group of helpers. Once everyone was armed, the boy's mother gathered everyone and went to the hall where the infected were being quarantined. In front of everyone, she accused the experts from the CDC of being the real virus spreaders. Alan and Kyle tried to argue, but they were powerless in the face of this group of people blinded by lies. In the end, they could only watch helplessly as all the infected were taken away. The entire isolation hall was instantly emptied. Alan stood at the entrance, helpless and lost. He knew better than anyone what was about to happen to this group of infected people. Just then, Landry suddenly appeared behind Alan, holding an inhaler over Alan's nose. Before long, Alan collapsed, his eyeballs shaking, clearly falling victim to a hallucinogenic drug. When he woke up the next day, his head was spinning and he couldn't recall what had happened the night before. However, the dried blood on his fingers suggested that it wasn't as simple as just having slept. Thus, he staggered to the isolation hall. Kyle informed him that of the 83 infected individuals who had been taken away the previous night, only four had been found. The rest had disappeared, and if they weren't found today, they would likely die from the virus. But Alan felt that his experience the previous night didn't seem to involve the infected. When he arrived at the lab and didn't see Sarah, he suddenly recalled that he seemed to have done something detrimental to her. He was right. It turns out that a few days earlier, when Michael found out Sarah was an immortal, he was overjoyed. He sought out Peter in the dungeon and forced him to reveal how Sarah became an immortal. Peter kept shaking his head, not knowing the details of Sarah's mutation, but Michael didn't believe him. He decided to help Peter remember by pouring a large bag of rats into the dungeon. Poor Peter was so scared that he curled up into a ball. He exhausted all his strength to climb to the dungeon exit, only to be knocked down by an infected individual who appeared out of nowhere. After enduring so much torment, Peter finally gave in. Although he didn't know how Sarah became an immortal, he knew that she was pregnant with an immortal embryo. Michael perked up upon hearing this and immediately told his henchmen his plan. It was to use the hallucinogenic drug to control Alan, get him to capture Sarah, and then use his expert medical skills to remove the embryo from her womb. When Sarah woke up the next day in the dimly lit basement, her immortal's robust recovery abilities spared her from much discomfort. The hallway was scattered with several bodies of the deceased infected. It seemed they'd all been hidden in the basement. Sarah hurriedly took a pair of shoes. Just as she was about to leave to find an exit, she noticed an infected standing ahead. She immediately hid in a nearby room, only to find two children hiding there too. The infected outside turned out to be their father, now transformed into a monstrous killer. Everyone held their breath, their bodies tense. After a long while, the hallway finally fell silent. Taking courage, Sarah quietly opened the room door. The infected had moved far away, so she led the two children out of the basement. But the infected suddenly reappeared. Sarah, already injured, couldn't run fast enough. As they were about to be caught, Alan suddenly appeared and blocked the infected's path. Just as he was about to inject the infected, it fell to the ground, breathless. Counting the time, it had been only 36 hours from infection to death. 
This was much faster than previously estimated. Alan was once again reminded of the terrifying nature of the virus and decided that a cure must be found. However, Sarah was not in a mindset to work just yet. She needed to check on the condition of her abdomen as soon as possible. Unexpectedly, there was an ultrasound machine here. Alan turned it over several times and found nothing inside her belly. Sarah was on the brink of collapse, but she couldn't remember anything from the previous night. Alan did not hide the fact that he had been controlled by hallucinogenic drugs the night before, which infuriated Sarah. After all, Alan was the biological father of the child. But soon the infection incident in the manor had escalated beyond control. Most of the missing infected were relatives of the manor's residents. After searching for a day without any sightings, they had no choice but to confront the leader, Michael. The once revered leader was now met with disdain, with some even expressing their dissatisfaction with trash. This instantly humiliated Michael. He quietly moved to the lab and began to concoct a special drug. Amy immediately recognized it as a deadly poison. Michael calmly revealed his plan to conduct a thorough cleansing. After a reset, he was confident he could rebuild an ideal manner under his control. Amy would become the mother of a new generation. Upon hearing Michael's intentions, she was naturally unwilling. Michael had no choice but to lock Amy in the lab's glass cabinet, stating that after cleansing the residents, he would focus on the reproduction plan. Before long, Michael gathered all the residents in the isolation hall, his face filled with excitement. He announced that the CDC had developed a drug to prevent the virus. As long as they drank it, they would never be infected for the rest of their lives. However, the people were not fools. They hesitated about whether to drink the vaccine in front of them. Meanwhile, outside the isolation hall in the corridor, Kyle, Peter, and Anne were rushing over here as fast as they could. They looked as if they knew about Michael's ruthless plan, their faces filled with anxiety. It turned out that Kyle had walked in on Michael concocting the poison earlier. He also vaguely heard about Peter being held captive from a conversation. So he went to the manor's backyard and eventually found the dungeon where Peter was held. As he was preparing to save him, he saw Anne was also there. It turned out that the CDC, after analyzing the infected honey fed to the residents, had deduced that this was a man-made accident. So Michael immediately sent his men to investigate everywhere. To his surprise, they found the remaining infected honey in Anne's wardrobe. Without giving her any chance to explain, Michael ordered her to be thrown into the dungeon. Amy was overjoyed because she was the one who had framed Anne. Anne and Peter, who originally had no intersection, thus spent a wonderful but smelly night in the dungeon together. When Kyle found the dungeon, he lowered a rope and told the two that Michael was concocting a drug that smelled terrible. Upon hearing Kyle describe the characteristics of the plant, Anne guessed it was Michael's big cleanup plan. She had heard from her grandmother that Michael had conducted a cleanup of the tribe over a hundred years ago. The three were shocked after hearing this. They broke out of the dungeon and ran towards the hall. But when they finally reached the isolation hall, they found the door was firmly locked. They were too late. At this point, Michael in the hall noticed some people had doubts, so he drank the vaccine in front of everyone. The crowd felt a huge relief, and each drank their share. Little did they know that the Grim Reaper was drawing near. Only a little boy, who was too playful and knocked over the drug, noticed that many people were showing signs of pain and coughing. Within just a few minutes, people started to fall to the ground, breathless. Only Michael, due to his immortal constitution, didn't get poisoned. But the boy who escaped the poisoning was soon discovered. Michael handed him another cup of poison with a kind and benign smile on his face. When Kyle and the others finally pried open the hall, all they saw were bodies lying everywhere. Kyle even recognized a few familiar faces, finding himself overwhelmed with mixed emotions. However, Michael was feeling invigorated. His cleanup plan had been successfully completed. Next, it was time to find Amy for the reproduction plan. Unexpectedly, Amy, who had previously been resistant, became extremely cooperative. But at the crucial moment, his henchman Landry, along with a group of men, surrounded Michael. It turned out that she had been in cahoots with her boyfriend all along. Now that most of the residents loyal to Michael were dead, it was her moment to take control of the manor. Her hatred for Michael could no longer be concealed. Knowing Michael's immortal status, she didn't want him to die so easily. She had Michael locked in the dungeon and ordered the exit to be sealed shut, letting him experience a fate worse than death. This was a thousand times more painful than killing him directly. Michael's howls echoed in the dungeon. Even so, he was an eternal being while Amy would ultimately have to face old age and death. 
His meaningless curses left a bitter taste in Amy, and her desire for immortality grew stronger. She knew the only way was to start with the immortal Sarah. At this moment, Sarah had just arrived at the isolation hall. Seeing bodies strewn across the floor, she was horrified. Peter, however, was filled with rage upon seeing his brother, Alan, who had abandoned him. He cursed and charged at him. Kyle quickly stepped in to prevent the two brothers from fighting. Just then, gunshots rang out from outside the hall. It turned out that the security commander had arrived with her team. Seeing the bodies, she was slightly taken aback. She was here to evacuate the virus experts present. Surprisingly, the virus had spread beyond the island, with 75 people infected at the sea post to the southwest. As he spoke, more gunshots came from outside. It was the guards discovering infected individuals. Alan rushed out to stop them, insisting that these people could still be saved if a cure was found. Just then, Sarah recognized one of the infected individuals who had been shot dead. She had personally shot him down outside the manor five days ago. Yet he hadn't died from the infection, suggesting a possible method of mitigating the virus existed outside the manor. This might be their chance to find a cure. The security commander, seeing their convincing argument, decided to postpone the evacuation plan and go outside the manor to search for clues to solve the virus problem. However, what they might face could be even more dangerous than the infected. The soldiers, fully equipped and ready, cautiously left the manor. They were preparing to search the forest for a solution to the virus. Everyone knew this mission would be tough, as the vast land could contain unknown and terrifying threats. Sure enough, when the armed squad finished their lunch break and roll call, they found one of their comrades missing. No one knew how he disappeared. The security commander could only urge everyone to stay alert and search the surrounding area. Not long after, they received a report that the missing comrade had been found. But when they arrived at the scene, everyone gasped in horror. The man was hanging upside down from a tree, his eyes nowhere to be found. The security commander felt that the perpetrator would strike again, and they needed to expand the search area. Kyle at the forefront noticed a rabbit hanging from a tree, its eyes missing, a sight he was all too familiar with from when he first arrived on the island a few days ago. He took it as a dangerous warning. Just then, gunshots echoed from afar and everyone rushed to check. Kyle stayed put as he spotted a familiar figure. It was the little boy who was immune to the virus and had been missing for a long time. Kyle ran up to him and was about to call out when a tremendous force came from behind, knocking him unconscious. When Kyle woke up again, he found himself in a small cabin, his hands restrained on a table. Beside him stood an infected individual who appeared much more lucid than the others. She even offered him food. However, when Kyle looked closely at the contents of the bowl, he couldn't help but feel nauseous. Shockingly, it contained a human eyeball. The woman was quite displeased with his reaction and made a move to gouge out Kyle's eye. Suddenly, another infected individual appeared. He drove the woman away, protectively claiming the food as his own and muttering something about it being tastier when fresh. Kyle finally reacted and lifted his head sharply, only to see several human torsos hanging from the ceiling. He broke out into a cold sweat. When the infected individuals had finally left, he strained against his bindings, but to no avail. Just then, the missing boy appeared. He had been taken captive here, and unfortunately, one of his eyes had become a meal for the infected. The boy explained to Kyle that the infected here have been able to survive and maintain a certain level of lucidity by consuming a particular red liquid. The boy wanted to free Kyle, but in the face of the infected, he was helpless. Kyle knew he couldn't stay here for long. Seizing the opportunity in the dead of night, he mustered all the strength he could and finally broke free from his bindings. As he was leaving, he didn't hesitate to take all the valuable items in the room with him, planning to study them later. However, as soon as he ran out of the cabin and entered the forest, he realized his mistake. This place was overrun by the infected. Kyle couldn't even tell his directions, let alone escape. Seeing that the infected were about to catch up, he made a desperate decision. He took out the virus-carrying honey he had collected and gulped it down. It was an act of desperation. Rather than being eaten alive, he would rather become infected himself. Surprisingly, Kyle's method worked. The infected sniffed at him but lost their appetite. This didn't mean the infected wouldn't kill him, though. Kyle was kicking himself for his decision. At the crucial moment, gunshots rang out from a distance. Two infected individuals fell instantly. It turned out that Dr. Allen had arrived with the guards. Kyle didn't dare withhold anything at this point. He told them about the tree sap that could alleviate the symptoms of the infection. They needed to find it as soon as possible, or Kyle would die from the infection in two days. Luckily, the little boy had gathered tree sap with the infected before and knew roughly where to find it. 
The group hurriedly moved forward, but Kyle's infection symptoms were getting worse by the minute. He began to have hallucinations, constantly feeling like the little boy was mocking him for his infected status. He was almost on the verge of madness. Seeing this, the security commander decided to temporarily bind his hands. However, as time passed, Kyle's condition worsened. He even contemplated throwing the boy off a cliff. Thankfully, Alan kept talking him down, allowing him to regain a shred of sanity and eventually spare the boy's shitty life. A while later, they saw that the tree secreting the magical sap was right across the cliff. The group finally completed their mission. Not only did they find the sap that could alleviate the virus, but they also brought back the boy, who possessed antibodies. They believed that it wouldn't be long before they could develop a cure. However, little did they know, within just two days of their departure, drastic changes had occurred in the manor. It's revealed that Julia, now the representative of the Laria group, had also arrived. Since being taken away, Julia had gradually integrated into the Laria group's board of directors. She wanted to change their cruel ways all by herself. The Laria Group's top management recently noticed that the population growth rate was quite high, which would put a huge burden on Earth's resources. Therefore, they planned to execute a cleansing plan, using the newly developed Narvik virus to wipe out more than 70% of the human population. This would provide a more sustainable future for their immortal beings. But Julia thought this method was too cruel. She found out from company information that Michael, an immortal not affiliated with the company, had invented a technique for rapidly sterilizing humans. Julia decided to come to the island to retrieve this technology to replace the human cleansing plan. Previously, Peter was dispatched for this purpose, but he was overly focused on capturing Alan, causing the mission to make no progress. Julia was so angry that she berated him. However, Anne couldn't stand it any longer. After coming out from the dungeon, she found that the entire manor had changed. Everyone was obeying Amy's orders, not taking her into consideration at all. Anne was once one of the top three generals under Michael, and naturally, she wouldn't sit idly by while her power was being usurped. So Anne came up with a plan to cozy up to Peter, hoping he could help her regain control of the manor. Now seeing Peter being put in his place, Anne stood up to claim credit. She was well aware that the sterilization technology Michael possessed came from the magical apple tree, which could sterilize anyone who consumes it. Upon hearing this, Julia perked up, expressing a desire to take some seeds. However, Anne informed her that this type of tree doesn't produce seeds and has been propagated by grafting from passed down rootstocks. In order to gain the support of Julia and others, Anne took them to see the tree root. But when she opened the storage cabinet, she was shocked to find that it had disappeared. Julia quickly sought out the actual controller of the manor, Amy, when she realized she couldn't rely on this lead. Amy, understanding Julia's purpose, offered to provide the magical tree root. The condition was that she be transformed into an immortal. The two struck a deal, each getting what they needed. However, little did they know this transaction was a complete deception. Amy, in fact, was unaware of the existence of the magical tree root. Only three people knew the truth, Anne, Michael, and his henchman, Landry. But Amy was willing to go to any lengths to become an immortal. She even tried to find a way through Sarah, using her unborn child as a threat. Knowing that the nutrient solution couldn't last long, a highly anxious Sarah was forced to tell Amy that she had mysteriously mutated after consuming an immortal's spinal fluid. Upon hearing this, Amy became interested and forced Sarah to give her a dose of the spinal fluid. Sarah wanted to say something more, but she was at a disadvantage and had no say in the matter. That afternoon, Amy extracted a tube of spinal fluid from Sarah, and it was Sarah's turn to inject her. Landry stepped forward, suggesting that the transplantation effect was uncertain and it was better to experiment on himself first. If successful, he and Amy could become immortals together. This was destined to be a highly risky medical experiment. As soon as a tube of spinal fluid was injected into Landry, he began to howl in agony. His entire body was shaking. It was clear that the experiment had failed. Amy was also terrified, and she quickly left the ward. However, after Julia provided her with the information, Amy knew that Landry must know the location of the magical tree root, so she hurried back to ask him. But after the failed operation, Landry had turned into a monstrous creature. Despite Amy's continuous calls, she received no response. Frustrated, she berated and hit him. She then went off to find the tree root herself. Relying on her years of understanding of Landry, Amy guessed that it was likely hidden in the tower of the manor, his favorite place. Sure enough, her guess proved right. To get the tree root, she even watched as her boyfriend fell to the bottom of the tower. 
Finally, Amy managed to meet the conditions of the deal, but surprisingly, Julia did not know how to transform an immortal. She had to seek Sarah's help. After all, it was Sarah who had completed the transformation using her spinal fluid. Sarah was also helpless at this time, having just experienced a failed spinal transfer experiment. Julia suddenly remembered that she had just become an immortal and then performed a transplant on Sarah. Perhaps the stem cells hadn't solidified at that time, which was why it was successful. Now, after so much time, a forced transplant was bound to fail. Sarah also wanted Julia's help in getting her child back. However, after careful consideration, they decided to give up. If they forced the cabinet open, they might destroy the jar holding the nutrient solution. In a sense, both of them needed something from Amy, so they decided to cooperate. However, before they could implement their plan, Alan returned and noticed a large number of armed forces gathering on the sea not far away. The security commander believed that the military was carrying out an encirclement operation, possibly to prevent virus spread and eliminate all living beings on the island. As a terrifying virus was spreading on the island, it was surrounded by an imposing naval fleet. To prevent further spread, the military was forced to eliminate all life on the island. Although the security commander was also appointed by the authorities, their evacuation plans were delayed indefinitely, and now they were also on the list for annihilation. Alan knew that the only way to save themselves was to quickly develop a cure for the virus. Perhaps the cure could be used to negotiate a way out. The key to this was the little boy, who was immune to the virus. However, Alan's mind was not entirely on this matter. He also had to meet an important person, his old flame, Julia. Over the years, Alan has been opposing the Laria group, burning almost every one of their bases, just to rescue Julia, all because of a request she had made. Unfortunately, ever since Julia became immortal, her mindset changed. She did not want to leave the Laria group at all. She even found a suitable excuse, using sterilization to substitute for the Laria group's cleansing of humans. However, Alan's considerations were more comprehensive. He believed cutting off descendants was no difference from killing them all at once. But Julia simply would not listen to his advice. This once passionate couple parted on bad terms. She did not ask for Alan's help again, but began to implement her own plan. In order to get the tree root from Amy, which could cause rapid sterilization, Julia and Sarah collaborated. They proposed a plan to turn Amy into an immortal by re-implanting Sarah's immortal child into Amy's body. Through breastfeeding, the maternal body would merge with the immortal genes. This plan sounded risky, but Amy decided to try it. As she fell into unconsciousness from the anesthesia, she held Sarah's hand, expressing their sisterhood. Sarah became sad and angry by that, but to complete Julia's plan, she could only suppress her anger. When Amy woke up from unconsciousness, Julia announced that the transplant was successful. Amy held up a mirror to see her pupils had indeed turned silver. She was excited. After many years, her long-held wish finally came true, so she readily told Julia that the magical tree root was hidden in the tree stump outside the manor. Just as the transaction between both parties was about to be completed, Anne became panicked. She decided to risk it all and pull Peter, her only helper, onto her side. Over the years, she had been involved in believer management and was particularly good at psychological attacks. After several soul-searching interrogations, she completely unleashed the demon in Peter's heart. He felt that the proudest moment of his life was when he became an infected person at the Arctic base, being able to control everything and command everyone. Anne smiled faintly after hearing this. This was the effect she wanted. Then, she mysteriously led Peter through the dark corridor and arrived at the secret chamber on the lowest level. Unbelievably, a huge lab was hidden here. Countless humans were fixed on racks, their teeth and tongues all pulled out. An infusion tube was connected to their mouths to ensure they wouldn't starve to death. Anne said these were all rebels who opposed the manor leader Michael. Now their only use was to produce offspring, to become the raw material for Michael to create immortals. Now that Michael had fallen, Peter could enjoy the feeling of control here again. As the two were talking, a woman happened to give birth to a baby. Under Anne's inducement, Peter slowly picked up the knife and cut the woman's wrist. The feeling of controlling everything and acting recklessly enchanted him. He expressed his desire to control the manor and eliminate all unrelated outsiders. A crazy and bold plan was born. The setting sun's afterglow shimmered on the sea surface as a few military aircraft loaded with poison streaked across the sky, heading towards the unnamed island. Just before reaching their target, a massive amount of poison poured out from the aircraft. Only then did the survivors in the manor realize that the terrifying purge had begun.
done. The soldiers guarding the island were still sealing doors and ventilation ducts at the time. Upon noticing the approaching planes, they tried to don their protective gear, only to find it all destroyed. With no other option, they braved the poison fog, attempting to retreat indoors, only to discover the doors were all locked by Peter. In the end, they could only perish in the poison fog. Only the immortal Julia, immune to all poisons, fearlessly ran out of the manor to find the root of the tree. Amy, who had just become an immortal, believed herself to be unique and voluntarily dove into the poison fog, excitedly shouting as if celebrating the arrival of her own era. However, she quickly realized something was wrong. She was not really immortal. It turned out that during the transplant surgery, Julia and Sarah had merely injected silver pigment into her eyes. Poor Amy was tricked and ultimately died due to her own greed. When the dust settled, Peter and Anne emerged from the room. Unexpectedly, they were the ultimate winners. Even Julia had to admit defeat as the magical tree root had completely lost its vitality after being corroded by the poison fog. In contrast, Alan had been hiding in the lab conducting research during the fog. That's how he escaped unscathed and also developed a cure for the virus. After testing it on the infected Kyle, the results were promising. Kyle, through this incident, saw Alan in a new light. He was not an irredeemable criminal, but a virus expert dedicated to public safety. Kyle asked him if he really blew up the Laria headquarters in Paris. Alan did not answer directly, but gave a bank safe deposit box number, explaining that all evidence was stored there. He then stood up and returned to the lab. On the other side, Sarah was injecting nutrient fluid into a baby bottle, while Julia had not given up on finding a method to sterilize humanity. Since the tree root had lost its vitality, she would look for the magical tree itself. Through Anne, she learned that the tree had long since died and only Michael knew its location. He had even made a portrait of it and hung it on the wall. Perhaps there would be some clues in his notes. So Julia came to Michael's office only to find that it had a new occupant. Peter was now in charge. Unexpectedly, he not only flatly refused Julia's request to peruse the notes, but also ordered Anne to get rid of outsiders like Alan. As the few remaining residents of the manor armed themselves, they couldn't find their targets. It turns out that the boy's mother, in gratitude to Alan for finding her child, had informed them of Peter's plot well in advance, giving Kyle and the others ample time to hide. However, for her actions, she was murdered by Peter. At this point, Julia had taken down the portrait of the tree from the corridor. She decided to use the sun, moon, and stars in the painting as reference points to deduce the specific location of the tree in the painting. With the assistance of Alan, they had actually managed to roughly determine the target's position right under the clock tower in the monastery. The two rushed to the church hall, but looking around, there was no trace of the tree. But Julia noticed something unusual about a section of the hall's floor. Both of them managed to pry it open, revealing a huge tree stump. There must be an entrance leading to the lower levels nearby. After a search, they indeed found an underground chamber surrounded by withered roots of the tree. Julia quickly took some samples to test, but unfortunately there were no fungal components present. Just then, a flash of an infected person passed by, causing both of them to retreat in fright, resulting in the shattering of the test tube. However, while cleaning up the debris, Julia noticed that the liquid from the test tube was reacting with the soil. She realized that it wasn't the tree that had sterilizing effects, but the fungi contained in the soil. If implanted into a new plant, a sterilizing tree could be artificially created. However, Alan knew that if the fungi spread, humanity could truly face extinction. Taking advantage of the solitude, Alan brought several buckets of gasoline to the vicinity of the tree's roots, preparing to set the place alight and destroy the sterilizing fungi. Unexpectedly, Peter appeared in the middle of this, weapon in hand. It turned out he had learned of the existence of the tree fungi from Anne. Having just come out of the chamber, he ran into his brother Alan and knocked him down with a gun stock, then lit the gasoline on the ground, trapping Alan in an endless sea of flames. Meanwhile, Kyle and Sarah, who had been evading pursuit, had finally reached the top of the clock tower. Using the radio, they managed to contact the military headquarters, stating that they had developed a cure for the virus and needed to leave the island immediately. This was an offer that couldn't be refused. Soon, several military helicopters arrived for evacuation. By this time, the entire manor had caught fire. Fortunately, Julia had found an unconscious Alan earlier and braved the intense flames to rescue him. In the blink of an eye, Alan and the others were taken to a nearby city hospital. Kyle handed the virus antidote to the military commander who was grateful as this would save thousands of infected people. He then reported Alan's situation to his superior at the bureau, mentioning that evidence about the explosion at the Laria headquarters was in a bank safe. 
Unexpectedly, the perpetual troublemaker Peter had once again made contact with the senior executives of the Lauria Group and even secretly took some sterilizing fungi to sell to them. The executives were pleased, completely denying their previous plan to wipe out humanity with the virus. Unfortunately, Peter was arrested by the authorities soon after. It turned out that the explosion at the Laria headquarters was all planned by Peter, who had even tried to frame his brother Alan. At this point, Sarah was most concerned about Alan's safety. When the attending doctor stated that there was no hope for him, she resolutely walked into the ward. Somehow, she managed to revive Alan, but his pupils had also turned silver. Ten years passed in a flash. The Laria group sterilizing fungi successfully made all humans globally unable to reproduce. If one truly wanted a child, they would have to pay a hefty fee for a special surgical treatment. Surprisingly, the person in charge of the treatment was none other than the still radiant Sarah, indicating that more mysteries might need to be figured out. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.